Good day to you viewers, the Colonel speaking to you live from the Grange, British Imperial YouTube Broadcasting. To the Columbia Record DX686, Leslie Bailey and Charles Brewer present Jubilee Scrapbook. This is for the Jubilee of uh, King George V in 1935. Um, this one is part one, Accession and Coronation Royal Command performance with a speech by Clarice Main. Uh, National Service, um, an excerpt from a record by Lord Roberts. Tipperary, sung by Flory Ford, and she, uh, I think she introduces that one. August the 4th, 1914, the Countess of Oxford and Asquith, and the ultimatum, a war declared. Compare Patrick Kerwin. Right, let me go on to side two with For the Fallen, November the 11th, 1918. Uh, that's a speech by General Sir Ian Hamilton, first broadcast of Norman Long. He's actually uh, done a little rec uh, recording for this record. Uh, then it's the Empire Air Route, a uh, speech by Sir Alan Cobham. And then the Nation's Wish, a Chelsea pensioner, Corporal Keyes, uh, has a bit of a speech. And then the finale. Here we go, I'll turn over halfway through. On May the 6th, 1910, by the death of King Edward, the summons to kingship came to the only surviving son of the late king. His most excellent majesty, George V, by the grace of God, King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland and of the British Dominions beyond the seas, Defender of the Faith, Emperor of India, on June the 22nd, 1911, King George and Queen Mary were crowned at Westminster Abbey. Coronation year. Memories of rejoicing, the pageantry, bonfires and bunting, and stately coronation balls. The sympathetic interest of the king and queen in the daily life of their subjects was soon evident. For instance, in 1912, the first Royal Command variety performance was held. Here is Miss Perry's name. I expect you're all pretty nervous that evening, Miss Maine. I was indeed, especially as I had only been on the stage a short while, and was naturally very flattered at being asked to appear in company with Barclay Gannon, Tinky Valley, and Dexter Tillis. I sang my crinoline song, and it went like this. I am longing for someone to love me, and every day my longing growing stronger. I don't know what I'll do because I can't go on longing much longer. And next there comes back to us through these years the voice of Lord Robert, who is conducting a campaign for compulsory military training. Our very colony, the distant outworks of this empire, our one after another is getting to recognize the duty and the honor of national training for the defense of their country. But that voice of the summer of 1913 was unheeded by the pleasure-making crowd, to whom Polly Ford in the Isle of Man introduced a new song. It's a long way to Tipperary, it's a long way to go. The song was not a popular success, not that year, but August the 4th, 1914. Mr. Asquith in the House of Commons. We have repeated our request to Germany for an assurance in regard to Belgian neutrality. We have asked that a satisfactory reply to be given by 11 o'clock. <laughs> Mrs. Asquith, now the Countess of Oxford and Asquith, will tell you what follows. After a speech, I went to the Prime Minister's room. Then he sat at his writing table. For some time, we did not speak. Then I went up and stood behind his chair. So it's all up, I said. They answered, yes, it's all up. I leaned my head against his. He could not speak the tears. That evening I joined Henry in the cabinet room. The night was hot. Through the windows came the sound of thousands and thousands of people gathered outside by my family. We sat in silence. A clock from the left of it kicked out the hours. Then Big Ben struck. 
Outside, the crowd was still singing. In the cabinet room, the silence of the dawn. No answer from Germany. We were at war. Jump the other side. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning. We will remember them. General Sir Ian Hamilton. We will remember them. And let us cherish also undying gratitude to our children overseas, who, when Britannia had sent out her SOS, sailed under the white ensign to rally around the royal standard. To our own old contemptibles who passed so swiftly to the danger spot. To the territorials under contract not to serve abroad, who sailed from safe England with a cheer. To all those officers and men, and our brave women, who kept the flag flying through four terrible years, until, on 11th November, His Majesty was able to say, With you I rejoice and thank God for the victories which the Allied armies have won, victories which have brought the hostilities to an end. The end of the war was the beginning of a new age of swift and bewildering changes in politics, science, entertainment. Music by air. Here is Norman Long, who in 1922 was the first entertainer to broadcast from 2 L. Hello everybody. This is just a snatch of the very first song that I ever put over the air. <laughs> A remnant like London, I suppose it's all right, but Somerset is good enough for eyes. For you hear the pig grunt, and you hear the cows moo, and the ducks and the geese and the cockadoodle-doo. They say I'll be bound to go up there someday, but I say as that day hasn't come as yet. They fear to the music halls, no one denies. But if I want to laugh, well, no boxes I buys. I see my wife's face and I laugh till I cry. Down in our village in Somerset. Comfort by air. Introducing Sir Aaron Collins, the great pioneer of our empire air route. Immediately after the war, the Atlantic was conquered by the aeroplane when Alcock and Brown flew from Newfoundland to Galway in 16 hours. In the same year, 1919, the British R-34 was the first airship to cross the Atlantic and back under the command of General Maitland. The pioneer flights of Australia by the brothers Ross and Keith Smith in 1919 took four weeks. Compare this with four days taken by Scott and Black in 1934 and you have an idea of the progress made in aviation. Looking at the map of the world showing the far-flung British air route, we need not feel ashamed of the part the British Empire has played in the conquest of the air. 1923. His Majesty opens the British Empire Exhibition at Wembley Stadium. Joining with us in such stirring occasions, and sharing too in our perspectives, the King and the Queen won a unique place in the affections of our people. In the words of the King himself, all the peoples of this realm and empire are bound to me and to one another by the spirit of one great family. And now let one who has devoted his life to the service of the state summarize for us all that we would wish their majesty. Here is a corporal of the Royal Hospital of Chelsea. As a hussar, I have worn the King's uniform for 38 years. In India, South Africa, at Leeds in 1914, and now as a Chelsea pensioner. In our prayers and state problems, 
for having spared to us a king who has made us and efforts on our behalf, we have gratefully tried to repay in a small degree by service to our country. Long life, prosperity and happiness to him, and may God bless him and our king. people in there, don't they? Hopefully you enjoyed it. Thank you and goodbye.